Just like the counter of Los Pollos Hermanos, there's a whole lot going on behind the scenes of Breaking Bad. From shocking character choices to the show's lasting legacy, here's the stuff that only true fans know about the award-winning show. Once primarily a repository for old movies, AMC launched Mad Men in 2007 and Breaking Bad in 2008, positioning it as a major peak TV player alongside the likes of TNT, HBO, and FX. Oddly enough, all those networks had the chance to take on Breaking Bad and turned it down. As creator Vince Gilligan told the Television Academy Foundation about his TNT experience, Great meeting at TNT. Excellent meeting. The two executives who I pitched it to were on the edge of their seat. They're loving it. However, at the end of his breathless depiction of the first episode, the executive's final response wasn't nearly as positive as Gilligan had hoped. And then they looked at each other when I finished, I get to the end, and they look at each other and they say, Oh God, I wish we could buy this. Evidently, they were scared off by the fact that Walt cooks meth, so they asked Gilligan if he could make him a counterfeiter instead. Gilligan rightly thought that making Walt a counterfeiter wouldn't be the right formula, so he moved on to other networks. While Gilligan says the HBO executive he met with wasn't interested, FX actually bought the series, only to eventually reverse course. FX president John Landgraf eventually explained why they passed on the show while talking to KCRW's The Business. So we had three dramas with male anti-heroes. So the question was, are we defining FX as the male anti-hero network, and is that a big enough tent. Ultimately, FX decided to branch out and greenlit the Courtney Cox drama Dirt instead of going with Breaking Bad. After all these rejections, things were looking bad for the show. As a last resort, his agent sent it to AMC, which was looking to expand its original programming slate. And the rest, as they say, is history. In addition to TNT, HBO, and FX, Vince Gilligan also pitched Breaking Bad to Showtime in 2005. Gilligan later recalled to Newsweek about being five minutes into his presentation with the network president quipped, This sounds a lot like weeds. Gilligan hadn't heard of weeds, so he asked what that was, and the executive explained that it was a brand new Showtime series about a mild-mannered suburban mom who, facing a financial emergency, starts selling drugs. That's a premise very similar to Breaking Bad's story about a mild-mannered suburban dad who, facing a financial emergency, starts cooking meth. Two representatives from Sony Television were there with him, and he asked if they knew about weeds. They had, but they told Gilligan that weeds and Breaking Bad were completely different. Gilligan briefly considered abandoning Breaking Bad altogether, but ultimately, he trusted the Sony reps. And it's a good thing that he wasn't familiar with weeds. As Gilligan told Newsweek, If I had known of weeds weeks or even days prior to that meeting, it's likely I wouldn't have had the will to go on. The final episode of Breaking Bad aired in 2013, wrapping up five seasons in a way that gave closure to its main characters. As you probably know, the show ends with Walter White dying among his laboratory equipment with the strains of Badfinger's Baby Blue, and with Jesse Pinkman escaping his life as an enslaved meth cook for Nazis. That episode was titled Felina, which just so happens to be the name of the idealized young woman in the 1959 Marty Robbins song El Paso. That particular song, a country music classic that hit number one on Billboard, actually makes an appearance in the episode. The tune concerns an outlaw on the run who returns to the town where he committed a grievous crime. Hey, you know who else makes a return to the place where he committed some serious crimes? Walter White of Breaking Bad. Plus, in two strokes of wordplay genius, Felina is actually an anagram for finale, and it can be broken down into three chemical symbols, F-E, L-I, and N-A. Those represent iron, lithium, and sodium, which just so happens to be the vital ingredients in blood, meth, and tears. In other words, Felina is what Breaking Bad was all about all along. While dramedies have been enjoying their moment for a while, Breaking Bad is not that kind of genre buster. It was an extremely serious show. There's not much humor to mine in the story of a man who descends into darkness when he becomes a drug lord in order to pay for cancer treatments and prevent financial ruin for the family he'll leave behind. The closest thing the show had to comic relief was Dean Norris's work as obnoxious, cocky DEA agent Hank Schrader. And all that stems from Norris's confusion over how to play the role at his Breaking Bad audition. As he said on Conan, he doesn't necessarily think it's a full drama. You thought it was a comedy. I did. It's not? Well, it's interesting because it I, can, kinda, I, yeah. I can understand it's why a black you... comedy. A lot of Breaking Bad characters die in horrible ways. 
Walter White dies, Hank Schrader dies, Gus Fring dies, and Jane Margolis dies, to name a few. But plenty of other characters survive the series while coming very close to dying. In fact, creator Vince Gilligan nearly killed off Jesse Pinkman in the first season, and he proposed offing Skylar White, played by Anna Gunn, near the end of the series. He came up with the idea that Skylar would go with her husband and the Disappearer on their hideout trip to New Hampshire after all hope is lost. But while hiding out, Skylar offs herself rather than continue to be with her monstrous husband. Ultimately, the idea was dropped because the writers couldn't figure a way to bring Walt Jr. along if the entire family was going to go into hiding. As masterfully portrayed by Giancarlo Esposito, Gus Fring is among the most fascinating villains in TV history. He runs his meth smuggling business with cruelty, while never losing his dignity and poise. He also takes pains to never let his drug empire interfere with his successful front, the fast food franchise Los Pollos Hermanos. Gus's rise and fall is crucial to the series arc and Walter White's transformation, but he surprisingly wasn't originally part of Breaking Bad creator Vince Gilligan's plan. By early season two, frightening drug kingpin Tuco Salamanca served as the series' big bad, a factor Gilligan wanted to explore for a while. However, the actor who played him, Raymond Cruz, had to bow out due to prior commitments, Gilligan told Digital Spy. So Raymond Cruz became unavailable to us, and we thought, man, we're never gonna have a character as good and interesting as he was, then we thought to ourselves, why don't we go in the completely opposite direction? And that's how they decided to create a villain who was a buttoned-down, cold-blooded, soft-spoken businessman. And thus, you get Gus. Setting and filming Breaking Bad around Albuquerque, New Mexico gave the show a vast and beautiful desert landscape where all sorts of criminal activities could go on unnoticed. But it also presented an Everytown USA dynamic to contrast with the dark journey of Walter White. It wouldn't have been the same show where it set somewhere else, and it almost was. In the 1990s, Riverside, California earned a reputation as one of the United States' most active meth turfs, and that's where Vince Gilligan originally set his series. Studio Sony Television suggested to Gilligan that he change Riverside to Albuquerque because the show would be cheaper to shoot there, owing to tax breaks for TV productions. The rest, as they say, is television history. Breaking Bad fans love to visit the real-life locations depicted on the show. One of the most sought-after locales is the White's humble home, although the people who live in and near the house are over it. The residents of the White House got so tired of gawkers and fans who stole rocks and other garden items as souvenirs that they ordered construction of a six-foot-tall iron fence. The homeowner's daughter told Albuquerque's KOB that the fans they feel the need to tell us to close our garage, get out of the picture, you know, tell us what to do on our own property. Building a fence also put an end to another intrusive fan activity, which involved reenacting a moment from a third season episode when an angry Walter White throws a pizza on the roof. In 2015, Breaking Bad creator Vince Gilligan implored fans to stop. And let me tell you, there is nothing original or funny or cool about throwing a pizza on this lady's roof. An Easter egg is hidden throughout the second season of Breaking Bad. Four non-consecutive episodes open with ominous black and white teaser clips, seemingly unconnected to the show. But string those four segments together and they form a cohesive whole, depicting the aftermath of a horrific plane crash. And when the titles of the episodes featuring those clips are similarly placed together in order, they form a sentence. 737, down, over, Albuquerque. Breaking Bad creator Vince Gilligan has said that he and his writers worked very hard to come up with episode titles with proper dual meanings. On the surface, 737 refers to the $737,000 Walt wants to leave behind for his family. Down is about Jesse being down and out. Over concerns Walter thinking his drug-making days are finished, and ABQ is an abbreviation for the show's central location of Albuquerque. Season 2 wraps up with a plane crashing practically in Walter's backyard, a 737 down over Albuquerque. As Gilligan told NJ.com, It seemed like a big showmanship moment, and to visualize in one fell swoop all the terrible grief that Walt has wrought upon his loved ones and the community at large. The central through line of Breaking Bad is pretty easy to see. Walter White, once a regular family man with a regular job as a high school teacher, slowly turns wicked as he becomes more embroiled in the manufacture and distribution of methamphetamine. 
That's all very literary, but television is a visual medium, and Breaking Bad expresses its arcs visually. In an article for TDYLF, graphic designer John LaRue points out that the characters' trajectories can be tracked by the colors of clothes they wear over the course of the show. Marie Schrader loves purple and wears it a lot, but keep an eye out for the darker colors she sports during a kleptomania relapse. Walt Jr. apparently wears colors that indicate support for other characters. Skylar White starts out favoring blue, but her palette turns dark when she gets wise to her husband's other life. As for Walter White, he wears drab khaki after bad cancer news or a personal setback. However, when he gets more involved with Gus Fring, more blue shows up in his wardrobe. A nod to his signature blue meth. Of all the horrible things Walter White does in Breaking Bad, the very worst may be letting Jane die. Portrayed by Kristen Ritter, Jane is Jesse Pinkman's recovering addict's girlfriend, whom he pulls back into the world of drugs. She dies after choking on vomit after an overdose while Walter watches her die without doing anything to stop it. It's a dark moment, and it was almost even darker. As part of the Tribeca Talks series, Cranston explained that in earlier drafts of the script, Walt was even more involved in her death. He said, She starts to cough and she's on her side, and Walt looks at her and pushes her shoulder so she's on her back, essentially killing her. AMC and producer Sony Television objected to that bit, not because it was too awful, but because it would mean Walt would break bad too soon. That still represented an acting challenge for Cranston. When Ritter shot the vomiting scene, Cranston said that Ritter's face lost all characteristics, and out of that came the face of my real daughter choking to death. The actor added that even years later, he still gets a little choked up about it. Breaking Bad's fifth and final season premiere hit AMC on August 11, 2013, ending with the on-screen message dedicated to our friend Kevin Cordasco. That's the name of a Breaking Bad megafan who died earlier in the year after a long fight against cancer. Kevin Cordasco Sr. told The Hollywood Reporter, He and his friends watched it obsessively and ate pizza in his bedroom. There was something about the Walter White character, the way he took control of his illness and his life, that really resonated with Kevin. As it turns out, Cordasco's grandmother set up a cast visit, getting Brian Cranston to come meet his biggest fan. Gilligan apparently asked Cordasco if there was anything he'd like the show to explore. Cordasco responded that he wanted to know more about Gretchen and Elliot, the couple who, with Walter White, formed Grey Matter years before the show started. Thanks to Cordasco, Gretchen and Elliot reappear in Season 5. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite TV shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.